New evidence has emerged about the events which led to the deaths of hundreds of demonstrators in, the Uzbekistan, in Uzbekistan in May. A group of men are currently on trial in Tashkent, charged with terrorism and attempting to overthrow the state. They've all pleaded guilty. A sign say human rights groups that they've been tortured. Now the United States has been forced to give up its air base in the country after it criticized the government's human rights record. Channel 4 News has obtained video and eyewitness accounts of the events in the Uzbek town of Andijan, where the killings took place. Our foreign affairs correspondent, Jonathan Miller, has this report. Four and a half months on, and the only certainty about what happened in Andijan on the 13th of May is that a lot of blood was spilled. Exactly whose blood is still in contention, as is the number shot down. The Uzbek government says 187 died, most armed Islamist militants, terrorists. Human rights groups say more like 800, most unarmed civilians. These are some of the 439 survivors who fled the country in terror. They're now in Romania under UN protection, the only witnesses outside the reach of the Uzbek authorities. Their testimonies led human rights groups to conclude that the scale of the killing that day was so stunningly excessive and indiscriminate that it can only be described as a massacre, an atrocity. This refugee told Channel 4 News, they were shooting at us like crazy. When it started, he said, I hit the ground, and when I got up again, there were lots of people lying next to me. They weren't moving. I realized they were dead. For ten days now, a trial has been underway in Tashkent. Perversely, it's not the alleged perpetrators in the dock, but survivors. The 15 now on trial have confessed on TV and now pleaded guilty to conspiring to commit terrorism and stage a coup. They face the death penalty. The government's critics brand this a Stalinist-style show trial in the grand Soviet tradition of fabrication and violent coercion. An Uzbek reporter working for Channel 4 News was among the first journalists to sneak back into Andijan. With a concealed camera, she walked around the killing zone. This, she said, a city full of fear. A city that still bears scars despite the government cleanup. A city where families don't know whether their children or parents are in prison, in hospital, or dead. On the outskirts of town, there's a large, hastily dug grave. No names and numbers no one trusts. The government accused of burying the truth. The United Nations says a mass killing may have taken place here. But the regime of President Islam Karimov has resisted demands from the UN, the US and the EU that an independent inquiry be launched. This couple, Fatima and Kutubilo, lost their only son. He was shot. After the killings, their two daughters fled Uzbekistan in fear after their husbands were arrested. Now their parents look after 13 grandchildren. Fatima appeals to her daughters not to come home. We'll manage, she says. Can't the international community see what's going on here? Kutubilo says she talks too much. So what did happen on May the 13th? It started with an overnight jailbreak. Armed supporters of 23 local businessmen accused of Islamic extremism stormed the prison and freed them. These pictures from an Uzbek government video obtained by Channel 4 News. There was no audio. There's common agreement that the gunmen then seized a government building. Around dawn, they began taking hostages. Local officials, traffic cops, a district judge, policemen. Some would later be used as human shields. Some would be killed. Andijan Theater was set ablaze. The pictures, later captured from the dead gunmen, show them making Molotov cocktails as crowds of civilian anti-government protesters in the nearby city square swelled to 10,000. Eyewitnesses insist locals were simply venting anger over poverty and repression. Human rights groups brand this edited video an attempt to rewrite history, depicting the protest as violent, organized by well-trained armed Islamists. At the trial in Tashkent, defendants have accused foreign journalists of being part of a conspiracy bankrolled by the United States. The film ends before the shooting starts. The shooting began in Bobur Square. 
Armoured cars and snipers had periodically picked off groups of demonstrators during the morning. But it wasn't until 4 p.m. that government forces sealed off roads leading to the city centre. Armoured vehicles moved in, and at 20 past 5, as a helicopter hovered above, troops to the south side of the square began firing indiscriminately, directly into the crowd, with no warning. In panic, hundreds fled north, along Cholpon Prospect, but one kilometre from the square they found armoured cars and soldiers once again lining and blocking the road. Outside school number 15, those fleeing were ambushed. It was slaughter in Sniper Alley. The bullets were big, one survivor said. They would go through several people. We couldn't even raise our heads. The bullets were falling like rain. Another said, I just saw blood, insides and brains everywhere on the street. Those challenging the official version have been silenced or have fled. Channel 4 News tracked down Fatima and Kutubilo's daughters in a refugee camp in neighboring Kyrgyzstan. They'd had no news from home. They watched their mothers appeal to them. How's our brother, they ask. Our Uzbek reporter broke the news. Jonathan Miller reporting. Well, we're joined now by Dr. Shirin Akina, a lecturer in Central Asian Studies from the School of Oriental and African Studies in London. Why doesn't the Uzbek um, government want a, an independent inquiry? One normally has an independent inquiry when there is no functioning government uh, in a country. There is a functioning government in Uzbekistan, and they do believe that they are capable of carrying out a full and proper investigation. Uh, watching the report we've just seen, I was very struck by the fact that there was no attempt to listen to the government version. I think that from my own experience, and I had been to Andijan and walked over all the ground uh, that was shown here, I think there are many, many holes in the testimony that we see here and many questions that could be raised, not least the fact that had the government accused of slaughtering all these people in the square uh, just a few hours earlier, had they wished to prevent the refugees from crossing the border into Kyrgyzstan, they could have done so very easily indeed. The refugees were rather an odd group, about 400 young men and about 80 women and children. Normally, according to UNHCR, with refugee groups, there are many more women and children. Well, you mentioned UNHCR, but it's the very United Nations itself which is questioning the government's version of this. And the United States, after all, one of the closest allies of Uzbekistan, who uh, have had to call into question the government's version of events, and for doing so, are being expelled. I think this is part of the misrepresentation of the situation. Negotiations with the Uzbek government have been going on for 18 months or more. Six times over the last 18 months, the Uzbek government has asked for clarification of the American position. And I think one could well see that the decision on the part of the Americans to leave Uzbekistan was not so much connected with Andijan, but possibly connected with the future of American operations in Afghanistan. Well, could, could I just ask you this? I mean, you're not denying that there was a massacre. That, that's, that's one thing which we all agree on, isn't it? Well, actually, I'm not sure about this. Um, I from the investigations that I carried out, I'm not a police investigator, but from what I was able to find out on my visit there, I would suggest that the figure was actually very much lower, and I do think... That lower than the 187 the government says? No, about 200, between 180 and 200 seems to me uh, to be... That, even if it were that figure... Yes. Uh, ...is an appallingly large number of people to have been shot by the government. Well. They weren't all shot by the government, and that is perfectly clear uh, from when you talk to people there, a very large number of government uh, troops were killed. So there were fierce gun battles, which means that it was an armed, planned insurgency. I but, saw myself but the evidence. But you, being, being a sort of reasonably independent sort of character, would presumably feel the best way to resolve this is indeed an independent inquiry. Under the present circumstances, I don't think that would be the best way to achieve any positive result because the Uzbek government feel very strongly 
that they have been misrepresented uh, in the press, that they have been misrepresented. But if they have nothing to hide, have an inquiry. Well, I think in this country, too, people would be reluctant to have an independent inquiry. For example, the Brazilian government might want to have an inquiry here into the shooting of the young Brazilian. And I don't think the British government would accept that. Uh, well, so I, I do we, think we could, of course, go on for a long course, time. Yes. I'm afraid we can't. But uh, clearly there's a bit of a difference between a democratically elected government in Britain and what exists in Uzbekistan. These things are matters of opinion. And as you say, these are very difficult subjects and we have no time to discuss them further now. Well, thank you very much for coming in, Dr. Kina.